Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I got so fired up just a second ago with the last speaker. I'm going to go a little off script for a second. And I know I've got a tight time line here, but um, listen. For evil to prevail, what has to occur? Good people do nothing, right? How many people, how many good people do we have in this room? Raise your hand. How many good people do we have in this room that wasn't very good? That's right. We all have the opportunity to do something, especially in this arena. You have your own sphere of influence, okay? No matter where it might be. Um, in your family, uh, if you're a teacher, in the classroom, in the schools, with the parent teacher associations, and the like, you need to leave this room today and educate. Don't close the notebooks. Don't walk out of here and forget what you've learned. Your charge is to educate people who are not in the room about ACEs and what it really means. Because I deal with this every day. I need your help. You want to talk about true criminal justice reform? It's minimizing ACEs in Oklahoma so the prison population truly decreases. Truly! <laughs> you know, I, I throw people off a lot of times. Um, they ask the DA to come speak to the Rotary or the Juanis or the uh, Citizens Academy, whatever it may be. And they think I'm going to talk about the, the, the last, last case that I took to trial or uh, you know, some big current event that's going on in relation to criminal justice or whatever it may be. You know what I do? I bring a PowerPoint on Dr. Anders' study and ACEs. They first are a little bit skeptical going, I thought we asked the DA to come talk to us. this guy? <laughs> He's not a neurologist. He's not a psychologist. What's he doing talking to us about toxic trauma, toxic stress, cortisol? Uh, ten things I'm looking at right now. Well, I'll tell you what, pretty quickly they get it. Because what I tell them is there is nothing more important that they can leave the room with than knowing about ACEs. And how it affects them in their home, how it affects them in their neighborhood, how it affects them in their community, how it affects them in their state, and how it affects this country every single day. And so I put the ACE survey up. In a, in, a, in a room not normally as large as this one, but close sometimes. And I say, just answer the questions. You get a point for each one of those 10. Tell me about, as you were growing up, before you turned 18, were you affected by any of those 10 things? And all of a sudden, the room gets very sober and quiet. And people start to look down. And sometimes you even see tears come to their eyes. Because they had a light bulb moment that I had when I first began to understand the effect of toxic trauma on the brain and what the ACEs study really meant. And I had people come up to me afterwards and say, I'm so glad you came to talk to us about this. I'm a five. I'm a four. I'm a six. I had one man come up to talk to me afterwards. It broke my heart. He said, and he had a tear in his eye. He's this tough guy, man. He was a he was a tough guy. And he just got this tear in his eye and he said, Man, I never realized it. I'm a five. And it makes sense to me a lot of the things that's, that I've done throughout my life. I really couldn't necessarily understand even when I was behaving the way I was sometimes. And I said, Yeah, we've done what? It's treatable. You know, it's preventable for future generations. There are ways we can address your base issues. And then he ducked his head and he said, yeah, but because I was a five, my children are a seven. Wow. Yeah. It's important to talk about this stuff. So as you leave here, every individual at every seat in this room, please don't leave what you're learning here today in this room 
you are charged to leave this room and educate you. Because I'll tell you what, there's a groundswell right now. You know that wind that was blowing yesterday in Oklahoma? You know how quickly the fields get on fire? That can happen here, today, starting today, starting now, and you can take this clear across Oklahoma. And let me tell you something truth, truthfully. The leaders in this state are not a 23rd and Lincoln. Those monkeys don't know how to get along the way. <laughs> Those are not leaders. You are the leaders. The legislature always falls behind the people they serve. They are always behind the ball. One of the reasons is because they listen to lobbyists way too much. And they're worried about things that could be effective in an election cycle. Two years or four years. Well, guess what? This is generational stuff. This is God's timing stuff. This isn't going to change overnight in two years or four years. This is decades long before we're going to see a true positive change in Oklahoma. But it can start here today, and it's got to start today, and it's got to start now. Because in 10 years, if we look back today and we've done nothing, we're going to go, well, I guess we missed that opportunity. All right, I'm off script. But let me get back to the script. <laughs> Everything that I do every day deals with basis. And I'll tell you, I, 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 I was a foot star being in I got law enforcement at 19. And uh, I, I got to tell you, we were not trained on this stuff. It was stuff them and tough them. I don't care why they did it. They're going to go to jail. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that. That breaks my heart. Because I put a lot of God's children in jail and didn't even really care why. But now I do. And a couple of decades ago, I started to understand that there was a common denominator between between a lot of people that, 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 that intersect with the criminal justice system. You know, a lot of common history, a lot of common stories and the like. Uh, I didn't know what it was called then. I didn't know it was called Texas Talking Trauma. I didn't know it was called ACEs. But what people would talk to me about in their history, in their story, how they grew up, what their family life was like, it's exactly what it was. So when I see the ACE study, a lot of what went on and my eyes filled with tears with the one back. That's it. Finally. That's it. I went to speak to a group of gang members one time after two very high profile shootings. And uh, 21 young men showed up in a church. It was just me and them and the pastor. We were going to have a talk about what happened. And some of you have heard this story before. And I, and, and I said, why do you do the things that you do? You continue to kill each other. This self-inflicted genocide. Black, black men killing black men. You're killing your babies too. What are you doing? That was not common in the question. <laughs> <laughs> but I got better. And, and uh, over the next two hours with those young men, when they finally got to a point after we stopped yelling at one another, I begin to hear the stories. And you don't know what it's like to grow up and not know where your food is going to come from. Mom and dad were in prison. I was raised by grandma. She was raising my cousins as well. There wasn't any food. Uh, if you didn't carry a gun in our neighborhood by the time you were about eight, you were going to get shot down. If you weren't slinging dope, you weren't going to make any money to, uh, uh, to eat. To feed with your brothers and sisters. Uh, I got kicked out of school because I misbehaved. Uh, I tried to get back in because I couldn't read. The other kids made fun of me. And, uh, and uh, I knew the gangs would love me. I knew they would love me, so I, I, I dropped out of school. And that's what caused me to be here. And I looked at that table of 21 young men, about five of them who were at that table, I knew were responsible for murders in my community that we had not been able to charge them with. We didn't get the evidence, but I knew that they were good for them. And they're all telling me the same story. And you know what I realized? <coughs> These young, gang-involved men, many of whom had killed and murdered more than once, 
and the rhythm of the night. But for Charles the one who my mother and father. My age score is a zero. By the grace of God, my age score is a zero. And theirs is a seven. There's no difference between us and those that we call them. We are all them. And if you understand this ACE study and all the, all the science that went in behind it, um, it, it, it's real, it makes sense. And so when we want to move Oklahoma forward, let's focus on what you've learned here today and educate and go out. And, and God love your teachers in the room. My mom's a retired teacher. My sister still teaches in Norman. My dad was an educator. And they came home and I'd hear these stories at the table. Hear these stories at the table. They would cry about kids that they knew where they were headed. And they couldn't do a thing about it. They were the only adult in that child's life that was loving on that child. And they couldn't stop the trajectory. They knew they were going to die early, end up in the criminal justice system as a, as a juvenile or as an adult. This stuff is life and death. Don't think it isn't. This is life and death. Are you willing to save the life of a child? then leave this room and get engaged. You don't need legislation to authorize a movement. There is no legislation that precludes you from getting involved with others in your system, whatever it may be, and start working on these issues at whatever level you want to. Don't wait on 23rd and Lincoln to give you permission. You have permission. You've got permission. You have the responsibility to take it forward from here. I'm going to step out of the way in just one second. I'm going to Kim here take over, and she's going to talk to you about the trauma-informed systems that we've been blessed enough to have in Oklahoma City. We have some great success stories, and she and Church Everett and others in this room uh, who have helped us fund the Family Justice Center, Center Palomar. It, 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 it's great. It works. We're going to leave with some positive stuff, but. Listen, that's an Arimer's graduation. Don't, don't read the words yet. That's an Arimer's graduation. That's Ariel. That precious blonde child is Ariel at the podium. That picture on your right is a picture of her at her graduation at Reemerge. Reemerge is a women's diversion program where we take women who are going to prison. There's no other option for them unless they go into the Reemerge program and they have children. It's hard. You see the picture on the left? That's her when she was booked into jail. And so all I want you to do is every time you look at someone and you think that they're hopeless, you think that they're worthless, and they don't deserve to be looked at or loved on, I want you to look at that picture on the left. And I want you to realize that that person on the right was inside of that picture on the left. And all she needed was some love and some support and to get out of the toxic, horrific relationship she'd had with men and get away from methamphetamine. God bless you. Go out there. Move forward. You can do it. You have to do it. Don't let one more child die. Now we get to hear about a great system that we've got more in Oklahoma City. <coughs> And I'm impressed by how many steps you got into. I think you hit your goal. <laughs> so, my name is Kim Garrett. I've had the great honor of working with crime victims for the past 16 years. And so I've seen the tremendous impact of trauma exposure, short term and long term on the lives of people that we work with. And one thing I found is that people won't always tell you about their trauma, but they will certainly show you about their trauma. And so with, we just opened Palomar within the last year and one of the things we did is an art contest in our community that was symbols of hope. We asked local middle schoolers and high schoolers, what does hope look like to you? What does hope feel like to you? What does a community of nonviolence look like for you? 
And here's what we got back. Images of pain and violence. When you're asking kids, what does hope look like to you? Here's what they see. This little guy's burning and his eyes are sewn shut and his mouth is sewn shut. And this one, you can't really see it very well, but his hands say suffer and pain and he's got burning things on him. And interestingly enough, if you look around, there's flowers and there's the Devon Tower. Where do you think these kids came from that drew these art that we selected? It's in an affluent suburb Oklahoma City, and you're sitting in it. It's Edmond. These are kids in Edmond in our community. And what's interesting is recently their city council had a choice to develop a trauma informed program for children, and their city council said, no, we don't want those kids here. <laughs> so let's talk about those kids. Um, I worked in violence prevention all of my career, and I had the great honor of working for Police Chief Bill City, Oklahoma City Police Department. And we had this great victim services program, and people would come in with their children that were trauma exposed, and they'd have physical injuries, and they'd be in crisis, and we'd have this great array of brochures, right? Pretty brochures. And we'd say, go here for counseling, and go here for crime victims' compensation, and go here for housing, and go here for medical, and go here for forensics. And what would happen? Right? We failed them. And we, it was, certainly was not intentional. And so we started looking at the data. And what we found, it's overwhelming in Oklahoma City. This, what you're looking at right now, is a map of calls to service that are domestic related. So people calling 911 in our last calendar year, each blue dot represents a call to service. What we know is that there's almost 35,000 calls to 911 that are domestic related. So officers on scene do lethality assessment protocols. One of the questions they ask are, do you have children in the home? 78% of these callers have children in the home. Often, many children in the home. So imagine the trauma exposure to our children is tens of thousands every year in Oklahoma City alone. What's also very powerful about this visual is people tend to think when I talk to businesses and corporations that it's those people, right? People that look different than us, that talk different, they have different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, things like that. And the reality is, violence does not discriminate. We certainly see it every day in our services, in our criminal justice system. Uh, I think this is really powerful because it's a question that's on the A score. But one of the leading researchers in, researchers in domestic violence says, witnessing domestic violence is the single best predictor of juvenile delinquency and adult criminality. Interesting, right? Um, one of my mentors, Casey Gwynn, says this regularly, in America we raise our future criminals at home. We can love them when they're six or seven or we can lock them up when we're 20 and say we're tough on crime. It's kind of what we're doing, right? So Palomar is a really, really, really exciting um, initiative that happened in Oklahoma City. In 2015, community leaders, politicians, police chief, David, um, survivors all came together in a bold effort and said no more. These rates are unacceptable in our community. And they built a collaborative that is changing the framework of our community and how survivors are treated in our community. Um, one advocate in our Family Justice Center said what well, used to take seven weeks for victim service providers working together, courts, things like that, it used to take seven weeks and now by integrated services and not just co-living together but actually integrated and working together and building trusting relationships together, we have reduced barriers for clients and we're saving lives. Here is a list of some of our on-site partners that came together. So basically what you guys are doing now, we did it a few years ago for adult victims of crime, and you guys now have the opportunity to do this for trauma-exposed children and build a collaborative that can make a huge impact and literally save lives. 
Um, one of the first things we did when we built this collaborative, collaborative is we engaged survivors, and I think too often they're forgotten about. We build business hours based on what's convenient for us. We do dress codes and policies based on our convenience. And so one of the first things we did is we sat down in focus groups with survivors and clients and said, what's working? What's not working? What can we change to make things better? What is confusing in this process? What has created barriers for you? We literally have um, a survivor group called Voices and they come together and they vet everything from our design of our building, the flow of our process, our processes, our intakes. They look at our forms. They review everything and say yay or nay or what you're doing is victim-centered and trauma-informed or it's damaging. Interesting concept, right? Um, one thing that's interesting too that I started doing when I first built this movement with a lot of the partners is I started going to the service providers as if I was a client. I can't do that now because people know that I'm, I am a service provider, but I really would go into the court and see, was it accessible? Was there information available? How was I treated when I said I wanted a VPO? Um, what if I called the police? What was their response? What if I went to this agency? What was the wait time? And really got an idea of what it's like for our clients so we can reduce these barriers for them. One thing that's fascinating is in this collective impact model that we've built, agencies are changing things to be more trauma-informed and victim-centered. So officers used to respond in patrol uniforms with their guns, standing, you know, intimidating, not intentionally, but that's just how they present. Well, Chief City understood that that creates a barrier in reporting and the intimidation, and so the detectives at Palomar are actually in polo shirts and jeans, khakis. So they seem a lot more approachable and accessible, less intimidating. <coughs> One thing that's interesting is we started looking at how professionals respond to people, behavioral responses of trauma. And I'll give one example. We do a program called Camp Hope. I'll get back to that in a minute. But um, the first night at our camp, we had a little seven-year-old guy. He's a failure to thrive, tiny, covered in cigarette burns, whip marks, things like that. And um, he said to one of the mentors, I'm gonna kill everybody in my cabin tonight. Scary, right? So I'm pretty sure 99% of the population would say, you're not safe to be at camp. You're going home and you'd be a great candidate for Whitefields, right? That's most, how most people would respond. Luckily, we had national experts with us that were guiding it and we said, what's your plan? Do you have access to a weapon? Do you have, you know, blah, blah. No, no, no. And what we know from a trauma-informed response is that he was scared of adults. He was trying to push us away. And so in an act of desperation, he said something crazy. Luckily, we knew how to respond and we engaged him in doing a lot of comprehensive work and now he's adopted and high functioning and thriving. It's the difference of hope. Another thing we do is reduce barriers. Um, when we were doing our study tour and building this model, a few years ago we went and watched VPO court, protection order court, and they would stand up and say, if you have kids, they can't be in here. So what's a parent gonna do? They're gonna get up with their kid and walk out and they're gonna forfeit their right to protection. So we built a children's sanctuary, a trauma-informed sanctuary where children are safe so parents can leave their kids there and go to court. They can go to the hospital without having to explain being strangled or raped in front of their child. Um, trauma-informed, it's very exciting. We provide food, transportation. That was another thing that came from the police chief, somebody who gets it, a non-traditional ally, but he's trauma-informed and he realized transportation is a barrier so he took money out of his own budget, bought us a minivan, and we pay retired officers to transport survivors wherever they need to go, if they need to go to the hospital, if they need to go to the shelter, if they need to go to the courthouse, and they don't have the $8 to pay for parking, or you know they're confused by the system, we can walk them through it, really trying to mitigate barriers for clients. We provide an environment that says the survivors are worth it, and it's silly because 
Um, if you had seen the building before, you would not have gotten that message from, <laughs> but what we did is we engaged the community and we said, please help us. And we had a paint day and restoration day where we included over 200 people from the community that radically transformed um, what I can't even say what she called it, but um, <laughs> this non-trauma informed area to a trauma informed area with some paint and love. Um, we did research on colors and how that can impact people's response. We incorporated components of nature to help victims feel, feel at peace when they're getting services. And it's crazy because you can go in there sometimes and there will be 15 people in there. They're coming from a crime scene. Their lives feel chaotic and unstable. And it's quiet. And it's trauma-informed. And we've implemented things that are repetitive response to further calm people down. So. We've got rocking chairs, and we've got suckers, and we've got ping pong, and you know different things like that that actually calm your amygdala in a crisis. And then we implemented evidence-based initiatives, um, such as Camp Hope. This is a program that started two years ago in Oklahoma, and it's the only evidence-based, curriculum-based camping initiative for trauma-exposed kids. So um, it is in my opinion, one of the best programs we've ever done in victim services. And that's actually the police chief. And I keep pointing him out, but it's important because it's changing the discussion, it's changing the framework, and clients are benefiting from, from this coordinated response. So this was the first um, year when we did Camp Hope. We took 45 kids, ages seven to 17, to camp. And it's not just like a fun camp, but we also teach them how to cope with anger and rage. A lot of them have been really, really disappointed by their caregivers, they don't trust adults, things like that. And so we teach them how to safely deal with these emotions so they can adjust in schools and so they can adapt in different settings and things like that. So we took the A score this year for the first time with our kids. And guess what the average A score was? Eight. Eight. Uh, no, the average A score of our camp kids was a 4.8. So are they at high risk for long-term health consequences, deviant behavior, health issues? Are these the target population that we need to engage if we want change and not be sending them to David's office for prosecution? Yes. But these are the kids. We all know who these kids are, and so by engaging them, we can mitigate these. We also are doing scientific studies with these kids, and doing hope measurements. Hope is a mitigating factor for trauma. And so we do pre-surveys with our kids of what do, what do you believe in your future? Do you feel like you have pathways? Do you feel like you have people believe in you that can support you and things like that? And we found an increase of over 5% of our kids after camp. It's exciting, right? So it's time, I know David said it, I know several of other people have said it, but please get involved, use your energy, use your knowledge. There's so many people who don't understand childhood adversity. For the love of God, please educate jurors because they do not understand and terrible things are happening sometimes in cases. But what I really want you guys to know is I've worked with crime victims for a very long time, thousands of them. And if the message you get today is to go out and administer an ACE to every kid you meet, you are failing them. That is my trauma-informed response. Like, it is very distressing for people sometimes to administer these tests. If there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of secrecy, there's a lot of pain involved for this traumatization, and it can be really triggering. And I can tell you, I know without even talking to people when they've taken the test, because they'll literally come into my office like this, and they just stand there. And I'm like, oh, you took the ace. And they're like, how would you know? I'm a six. Or, you know, whatever it is. And so if you do administer aces, please do it knowing that if they say yes to number four, we're going to kick in this response. And if they say yes to number eight, here's a resource that's valid, and here's what their waiting list is, that you know the response, that it's not just data collection. These are people's lives. They are not guinea pigs. And so please do it responsibly. And you can build an army of allies in this movement. We did it. We've got hundreds of people um, 
from business leaders to nonprofits to government entities that have come together and said no more. And Oklahoma is ready for that. Our kids are ready for that. Kids are dying, and they need you to stand up. So that is it for me and David. Do you have any questions? But some people are certainly interested in the economic impact when you start looking at the long-term impacts of violence. We know that um, if there is a homicide in our community, that the average cost to our community is $5.6 million. Um, that gets people's attention when they're interested in economics. Um, we know that violence is predictable. Absolutely, it is predictable. That's why they do lethality assessments on scene because they know when, when perpetrators are escalating and it's gonna increase and something really terrible can happen. So investing in prevention and intervention now can save our community millions of dollars. I did a rough estimate last year and found that just in Oklahoma City, there's $28 million that are being invested just to help survivors as far as the DA's office nine million dollars at Oklahoma City Police Department with investigations, crime scene, dispatch, um, things like that, and then federal money that's coming in to support survivors through nonprofit agencies. So that's a tremendous impact. It has an impact on the workforce, um, mental health, we're building bigger jails. I mean, there's so many things you can take with it. You know, there's a lot of people out in our community that may not have the opportunity. I mean, they're in their lane, they're doing what they do every day as a business person, right? They're running a business, making money, hopefully. Um, loving on their families. But um, they're not in Palomar, they're not in the DA's office, they, they're, they're not uh, volunteering at the police department or at the Y or wherever else, you know, someone can, can volunteer. There's a number of wonderful agencies in this room represented here. But business leaders have the opportunity to support everything that's going on in this community. I mean, and it is a collaborative effort. It's not just what's going on in Palomar, but all the support agencies around it. And if you look at the number of agencies that support the Remerge program, the Women's Diversion program, I mean, it is, if when you look at the list on the back of the graduation announcement that, 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 that's handed out at every uh, Remerge, there are like 30, 30 businesses that are all funding it because it's, it's, it's an expensive program, right? So. The business leaders can engage. They can also bring uh, those who are in the, in the arena to their business and help educate at lunch and learns and things like that, which is great opportunities. When I talked about sphere of influences, business owners have a great sphere of influence. You know, you're gonna stay here over the lunch and you're gonna go through this training. You know, uh, of course most people will do it voluntarily anyway, but, but they are more than willing to engage. What we found is, is God bless Oklahoma and, and, and really, really everywhere. People are generally good people, and they want to help. They just don't know how. So if you reach out to the business community and say, we need your help, and here's how you can help, most of the time they're opening checkbooks. They're saying, what can we do? Can we come paint your place? Can we do something for the kids? Can we volunteer at Camp Hope? So there's a lot of things that can be done out in the community by people who you may not think would be involved. Well, there's an additional cost. If you look at, um, anybody can take the ACE study, but if you look at the cost to uh, the community, the taxpayers, ACEs affect uh, foster children and the whole cost to foster care. Um, I'm an adoptive parent of foster children. I'm sitting next to a former public defender who's now a volunteer, well, who's now with Lawyers for Children. And Lawyers for Children has a program that uh, involves education. Um, so if you look at just the impact on parents who are losing their children, uh, the custody of their children in foster care, and you look at the, the cost of caring for those children, even if you look at the cost of caring for the medical needs of the children who are 
born addicted to drugs, um, and the cost of insurance alone is still caring for those children until they're 18 years old. And I know, because I have adopted children that get a subsidy for insurance until they are 18 years old. And coincidentally enough, I've got a child that has attended Camp Hope, and uh, loves Camp Hope, loves the reunion events, and has enjoyed the, the Christmas events that um, uh, Mr. Prater has had on campus. So um, the cost to the business community um, is huge. The cost to taxpayers is huge. Um, I do supervise visitation, so I see parents who are uh, in, cap in custody battles and the cost of addiction and domestic violence. Um, I see people there and I do parenting classes, and I have those parents take the ACE study so that they can see how that light bulb can um, go off in their own heads and hopefully as a preventive factor of their own, have them take it from the perspective of their own child. So how we can implement this on our own without waiting for um, the legislature, we can do it on our own. I would also encourage, thank you all, love hearing you, you just inspire me, you give me hope, and give us hope, and I, I cannot, I say my knees in prayer every day, thank God for all my knees, because that's what's going to take and change this. But I would say for employers, back to the business aspect, and looking at the OK CEO program, and the 25 by 25, is to get involved, but also become a second chance employer. Hire these people. Hire someone who does present with ACES. Hire someone who's been diverted from prison and then listen to them and hear their story and look at them not as them, but as us, but as a we. And you know what? If they need to get off work for a couple hours or go to an appointment or go to a visitation or go get counseling, support it. Because in the end, your productivity will rise exponentially and you will make it up to some of these crises that we're actually facing. And so look at them not as a problem employee or a potential problem. Take a chance, people. Every one of us has had someone take a chance on us in our lifetime. And that is the very least we can do is step out of our comfort zone, start telling our story, start listening, take a chance, employ them. An employed parent's a whole lot better than an unemployed parent. Love on those kids. Volunteer. Give till it hurts and then give some more. Because it's only with these kind of actions and these kind of thoughts and these kind of leaders right up here and all throughout here are we ever going to affect any change. And I don't know about you, but my kids and your kids deserve it. Jimmy, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, <laughs> well, I love you, thank you. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to success um, is employment for people who are transitioning out of the criminal justice system, whether it be through a probation program, diversion program, or incarceration. If they can get a meaningful job and, 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 and be able to earn legitimate income, it, change, it can change the trajectory of their family. It really can. And I, I'll tell you, it works because I've got a remerge grad, re graduate that I admire. That's right, the DA's office has a felon in their office working, <laughs> and she's one of my very best employees. And I have a living faith graduate. He has multiple felony convictions as well. And let me tell you about these two people. People flock to them because they love them, because they're genuine and they're real, and they help them understand the world outside of the DA's office and the world outside of what many of us have ever experienced and they just love on them constantly. It's the coolest thing. Thank you very much. We have the Take Two Cafe. I'm really familiar with it. It's about 3rd in Maine. And it has women from the residence program there. The pie is amazing. You need to check it out. Um, but I have a question about how a lot of this can vary so significantly by county. So my understanding is that the DOC's female incarceration rate for Oklahoma County is something like 193 per 100,000 which is higher than the state average and like twice as high as Tulsa's. Um, obviously that's going to have a massive effect on children and families. How can we make sure that all counties are getting involved to make sure that we're not introducing another trauma into children's lives by locking up their mothers? 
Well, they've got to have diversion programs available to them, and they've got to be funded. I, I went to the I, I was at a meeting with the governor's office uh, two weeks ago, and I said, you want to continually talk about bed count? You want to continually talk about the high incarceration rate per capita of women and men in Oklahoma? I said, here's my pledge to you. You fund a thousand beds, a thousand, a thousand slots in a program like Remerge for men or women, I'll pull a thousand people out of prison. You give me five thousand, I'll pull five thousand people out of prison, not diverted from prison. I will find people who will fit into those programs uh, in our community, and I'll do it. You give me ten thousand slots, I'll do the same thing. My issue with diversion is, is, is that we don't have enough beds, we don't have enough opportunities, much like mental health and substance abuse beds as well. They're, Virtually non-existent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the counties, the rural counties, okay, we got it good in Oklahoma County, believe me, because uh, even though it's as it's challenging as it is because of the large population and the high, relatively, the crime rate's not all that high, but it is high based on, we can then compare metro versus rural. But one thing we do have are resources in the rural districts don't have anything. They don't have anything. And so they have that, the only thing is you take this perpetrator out of the community because they continue to break the car, breaking homes and the like, even though their ACE scores may be off the charge. Okay, I don't have anything to do, to do with that. So they've got to go to prison. So a lot of the rural districts end up sending people to prison otherwise would fit well in a diversion program in, in my community. We have time for one more question. Let's thank Kim and David for